With the laundry list of controversies Wizards of the Coast has faced in recent months, from the OGL debacle through the very recent Magic the Gathering accidental leak, things are looking quite grim for this once beloved company. But how will Wizards of the Coast fare in the next decade? In short, disgustingly well. It's simple. Wizards of the Coast is still riding high on their well-earned reputation. For now. They'll milk their goodwill in the community until they're as despised as another once beloved company, Blizzard. Now why do I think this? Hasbro executives such as CEO Chris Cox and the Wizards of the Coast president Cynthia Williams made this blatantly clear in a recent UBS virtual fireside chat. While a decent portion of the discussion talked about monetizing their already aggressively leveraged card game, Magic the Gathering, Williams had this to say to investors. Dungeons & Dragons has never been more popular, and we have really great fans and engagement, but the brand is really under-monetized. Their acquisition of D&D Beyond has given them much more direct data on user-based purchases than they've had access to in the past, and their conclusion was that 20% of the game's user base made up the vast majority of purchases. Now, if you've never played Dungeons & Dragons and have more of a gaming background, you'd call these individuals whales. Here in the tabletop community, we'll call them the Dungeon Master. Usually, the individual that opts to create the campaign and design the world will buy a number of the core gameplay books and maybe a pre-made adventure or two in order to get themselves familiar with the Dungeons & Dragons game system, and in turn be able to teach their players how to play the game. I believe Hasbro executives have likely never touched the game, which is why when they see this 20% number, they see 20% whales and 80% freeloaders. And their solution is to try and gamify D&D to unlock these customers through recurring purchases and digital add-ons. When it comes to their online digital tool sets, the idea is to sell what every live service video game does, aesthetics and digital accessories. They already sell digital dice in D&D Beyond, but I wouldn't put it past them to introduce sexy waifus or perhaps even adding in gambling mechanics found in games like Genshin Impact or Diablo Immortal to incentivize purchases. Maybe you can't buy certain books directly and must pull on banners for that rank 5 fireball. We can only hope, boys. Will these monetization practices lead to the further erosion of their brand and create an endless stream of D&D and MTG refugees? Probably. Will it end in record profits? Most definitely. If you're questioning now if Wizards of the Coast reputation can handle an almost monthly scandal, just ask our good friends at Blizzard Entertainment how they've been doing in the last decade. Retail box prices, battle passes, live service subscriptions, and that sweet, sweet microtransaction revenue. Wizards wants it all, and you better believe that they'll find a way. It's not all doom and gloom, because we've seen this all before. But first, let's talk about the OGL. For those of you who aren't familiar with the OGL that was introduced by Wizards of the Coast, it is an open game license which gives third-party creators the ability to use and modify certain content from Dungeons & Dragons and their own products. This license has been around since 2000, and I'd argue was the most instrumental in the growth of the D&D community, allowing for the creation of countless supplements, adventures, and even entire game systems using the D&D ruleset. If you've ever played a modded video game for years after the game publisher has stopped supporting the game, you know exactly how powerful a creatively free community can be for the shelf life of a video game. However, in early 2023, Wizards of the Coast announced proposed changes to the OGL that has caused a lot of concern among fans and creators alike. That sounds like your average video game publisher misstep. They see some guy on the internet makes a fun mod that gets a lot of traction and is able to make a few bucks off of it, and instead of the game publisher just being happy people are still playing a game they abandoned five years ago, they think about how the money is coming out of their fans' pockets and not directly into their bank account. They get furious at the community, they take away all the fun developer toys, and their beloved monthly active user metrics that they've been boasting in the last shareholder meeting plummets overnight. These changes would have caused a new royalty structure that would make publishers pay Wizards of the Coast a percentage of their revenue from products that utilize the OGL. This was met with an immediate uproar, as for over 20 years, small publishers and independent creators were able to make a living safely. Now they were being told that they would have to pay a fee every time they made money with OGL related content with the added risk that if it was too successful, Dungeons & Dragons would have the right to take your idea and publish it themselves without having to compensate you in turn. The OGL was promised to always be a key part of the D&D community, and quite a few content creators have devoted their careers based upon this promise. This is when something clicked for me and I began to realize that Wizards of the Coast is following a similar trajectory as another gaming giant, Blizzard Entertainment which had faced a similar controversy in community alienation all the way back in 2011. 
When Dota first gained popularity as a custom game mode in Warcraft 3, Blizzard attempt to claim ownership of the Defense of the Ancients name and trademark it for themselves. Blizzard saw a major backlash from the community, but the brand name of Blizzard was strong at the time, so animosity did not stick. Blizzard was trying to take credit for something they had no involvement in creating directly, which made the creators of those custom game modes start to, at the very least, humor the idea of creating these projects outside of the Warcraft 3 engine. Blizzard hasn't had the best track record when it comes to aiding grassroots movements within their games. Esports is another example of where Blizzard has failed when it comes to letting organic communities thrive, but their handling of StarCraft 2 is such a colossal failure it would take a whole separate video to talk about that. The important thing here is Blizzard's attempt to control the custom game mode properties as their own spat in the face of the open and collaborative nature that the Warcraft 3 custom game modes had built. A reality that Dungeons & Dragons players now know could be in their near future if Wizards of the Coast attempts to change the open game license again. The backlash against Blizzard's attempts to restrict communities' creative freedom was fierce, with many players and fans expressing their frustration. The situation eventually led to Blizzard abandoning their efforts to claim ownership of the Dota name, but Blizzard is still jaded many years later and would go on to make it very clear that all Warcraft 3 Reforged custom games are property of Blizzard Entertainment. Dota would go on to become hugely successful and inspire the MOBA genre, leading to the rise of communities around other games such as League of Legends, who has seen great success in the space. By contrast, Blizzard's entry was late to the party and never really took off in Heroes of the Storm. I won't go into detail on what happened to HOTS, just know that it wasn't a successful venture. Or Overwatch 2 for that matter. But that wasn't the only genre that Blizzard's mistreatment of Dota created because in 2019, Dota Auto Chess exploded in popularity as a new genre of game where players battled against each other using armies of chess-like pieces on a board. The game's success led to the creation of other auto chess games such as Teamfight Tactics, which just like League of Legends, is developed by Riot Games. This makes two largely popular genres of the games that stem from the mishandling of the community by Blizzard. We should really be thanking Blizzard for how hard they messed up custom game modes in Warcraft 3. Perhaps in a few years we can get another old Warcraft 3 game to inspire an entire genre that Blizzard can be late to the party for. Maybe canned bread? I don't want to make the future of the digital tabletop role-playing game space seem bleak, as I believe that it was a good thing that Wizards of the Coast tried to adjust the open game license when they did. They tried to establish a dominant position in the digital space, but got pushed back by the community. The brand from a standpoint of goodwill may be wounded, and Dungeons and Dragons may eventually lose its crown as the undisputed king, but they will still be relevant to the scene and make record profits. They will only start caring when alternatives force them to step up their game. That is the one positive that the OGL scandal gave us. Now many companies that happily worked alongside Dungeons and Dragons and create supplements are looking to shed their reliance on the OGL and create their own game systems. This competition can only be good for the community, as it will result in better products and services for everyone. There will be alternatives to Dungeons and Dragons that will rise up to taking all the refugees. It will likely begin to gain enough traction to make Wizards of the Coast sweat, just like there was for MMOs that eventually put pressure on Blizzard. It did take a very long time though. Wizards of the Coast can't get too comfortable though, we've already seen competitors like Pathfinder make adjustments to their game system and offer other third-party publishers a system-neutral, open RPG license. In addition, Critical Role just announced their own competitor to Dungeons & Dragons called Daggerheart. This show has had maybe the biggest impact into getting new players into D&D. If Critical Role were to change the Daggerheart for the next season, not only would their previously established fanbase be tempted to try this new game as the cast has fun with the game system, all future watchers of Critical Role will be introduced to the TTRPG world through Daggerheart and not Dungeons & Dragons. And it is hard to put a value on exactly how devastating that will be for Wizards of the Coast dominance in the space. I think you can look at Blizzard Entertainment's present if you want to see Wizards of the Coast's future a beloved titan of their industry that took untouchable intellectual properties and slowly eroded the trust of the community through scandal after scandal and a bit of corporate greed. You can blame the Wizards of the Coast decline on Hasbro, but we all know that is the same brand of cope that Blizzard fans have been on for nearly a decade now. Unfortunately, the Wizards of the Coast you once knew and loved may be gone forever, and they made that decision strategically. No king rules forever, but Wizards of the Coast is going to be just fine. Just ask Blizzard. Thanks for watching the video. I do a lot of RPG horror stories, but I'm trying to get into more of the commentary space, and I'll drop videos like this here and there. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. We'll see you in the next one. Farewell for now.